Thank you so much for being here at the Wild and Precious Life series tonight. I'm excited as I am every time we have this series um, and you're going to have a great time. I promise you that. So as you know, I don't do traditional intros. I do do intros, but I won't be reading bios. So let's get it started. Our first reader of the evening is Paul Tran. And Paul, it was fabulous and an absolute treat to get to hear you read at the Miami Book Fair last year. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm going to take you back to 2020. An interviewer had this to say and asked you some questions. The interviewer said, I'm interested in the process of poetic investigations that don't turn up something immediately or at all, too. How do you think about your pieces holistically? Do they have overarching categorical questions they seek to answer as a collective? And your work features a host of killer last lines. Conclusions, how do you think about these endings using the conceit of the investigation? How do you know when you've overturned the last stone for a particular piece? And I enjoyed what you had to say. You said this. I see in some ways my journey as a poet as that of writing a poem across a lifetime. Though this is divided into individual poems and individual books, it's still a singular and idiosyncratic mind at work, thinking through questions about life that keep me alive. In my first book, All the Flowers Kneeling, the poems altogether examine how a speaker survives in the wake of violence. I don't use the word rape anywhere in the book. I never say trauma. Each poem instead attends to the various and overlapping dimensions of survival. What if nobody believes me? What if things don't happen for a reason? What if I decide right here and now that none of this matters, that I can change and live a different life? Is a life that isn't this even available? What is my life? And in the framework of writing a poem across a lifetime, I see the poems in this book as a record of what my mind discovered. I needed so badly to search and document what I found so that I wouldn't forget, so that history might not repeat itself, though it does, or because it does. More importantly, and perhaps more interestingly, I see each poem in the book itself as another poet has taught me to see every poem in every book is an argument about poetry and the making of poetry. This argument isn't simply an aesthetic one. It's a phenomenally political one. The argument is, at the end of the day, that the poem is a real poem and that the mind that made the poem in its thinking, its discovery and enactment, is a real mind that belongs to a real person living in a real life, in a real place, in a real time. This argument about realness is an argument that marginalized people throughout history have made. I'm here. I'm valid. Listen to me. Thank you for being here tonight. The screen is yours. Lipstick Elegy. I climb down to the beach facing the Pacific Ocean, while torrents of rain shur the sand. On the other side, my grandmother sleeps soundlessly in her bed, her alyai of the whitest silk. Ah, uh, my mother, she knew her mother died long before the telephone rang like bells, announcing the last American helicopter leaving Saigon. Arrow shot back to its bow, long distance missile. I know she'd fly home if she could. She works overtime instead, curls her hair with hat rollers, rouges her cheeks like Gong Li and raise the red lantern. And I, I'm her understudy, hiding in the doorways between her grief and mine. I apply her foundation to my face, conceal the parts of me that she conceals, pu pu puckering my lips as if to kiss a man who would love me the way I wanted to be loved. And yes, I said all their bewitching names aloud. Twisted Rose, Fuchsia in Paris, Irreverence, I picked the lipstick she would least approve. Wrapped a white towel around my waist, danced for hours in the kitchen, checking my reflection in a charred skillet. I laughed her laugh. 
the way my grandmother used to laugh when she was alive, when she taught me how to pray from the goo dai bi when I braided her hair in the unbearable heat, my tiny fingers weaving each silver strand into a fishtail, French twist, each knot, another child she never got to name. And I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Mother of my mother, immortal Buddha with a thousand hands, chewing a fist of beetle root, your teeth dark as dawn, no child. In our family stays a child that their mother can love. Thank you so, so much, Justin, for having me and for giving me the chance to read tonight alongside Danica and alongside Carl, two poets who have certainly in so many immeasurable ways made my life wild and precious. And um, the poems that emerged that I'll be reading tonight come from an experience 10 years ago when I was raped in college and forced me to go back in time to reckon with the history of sexual violence that the women in my family endured as part of the French Indochina War and the American War in Vietnam. But I, as you said, don't use the word rape in this book. I do not use the word trauma because this is a book about love and survival. And it's a love letter to them. It's a love letter to women who cross oceans to build new lives for their families. It's a love letter to queer and trans people of color who every day have to invent their lives out of what seems like nothing. And tonight it's also a love letter to Carl and to Danica and to all the folks in the Zoom room. And because honestly, without them, I would not have been able to rise from where I was to where I'm now. And so in the spirit of this being, one wild and precious life. I'm going to do something I have never done before, which is read a poem from the book that I've never read before aloud. And um, it's the first story my mom ever told me, the story of Scheherazade, who many, many millennia ago, um, the myth comes to us that a sultan scorned by love took it as his mission to show his might by taking to bed a different woman every night and killing her in the morning until he arrived at the doorstep of Scheherazade's home where she volunteered in her sister's place. And as she entered that chamber, she begins telling him a story. And inside that story was another, and inside that story, another. And when dawn came, and she was ready for her end. He was so enraptured by what could possibly happen next that she survives her death in order to continue telling her stories and to do so for what would become the Central and South Asian collection of stories, A Thousand and One Nights. And so because from Scheherazade, we get narrative devices such as the frame story or the cliffhanger, the poem in which she appears is a sonnet crown with a sonnet crown in it. Um, I've been told that my poems are too long and so I will not be reading the sonnet crown inside a sonnet crown tonight, but I will be reading selections from it. And so this is my last poem and it's called Scheherazade, Scheherazade. Um, and I'm also told by my publisher that I need to hold the book up from time to time so that people who do not have it knows what it looks like when they order it. So here we go. And here we go. <laughs> Scheherazade. Far from the beginning and nowhere near the end. I'd lost count of the nights I spent in that room, knowing no more or less than I did thousands of nights ago when I thought knowledge still meant something in what was then my relentless pursuit of meaning, though I knew meaning couldn't be found or given, but made from what typically in my limited and limiting experience presents as meaningless, just as the image of the face in the mirror might have been had I not likened the image to a swan in a lake. 
or said, I was the lake. <laughs> I was the swan, the mirror, the face. What more was there to know? After what had been a long journey in silence, the driver asked me, what was I doing there? I told him I was a poet. I was there for a reading. I was going to read a poem I wrote about Scheherazade. He asked me to explain what I meant. I told him the story, how my mother told it to me when I was a child, how I had no idea it was her gift to me. How to survive, we told the story of our survival. He looked at me. I saw him look at me. Yours isn't just a story about survival. He said, yours is a story about love. In my version of the story, Scheherazade had no plan. As she waited for the king to come, the moon rose, the candles burned, the moths, oh, the moths gathered. In my version of the story, Scheherazade slipped from the bed. She, at the window, leaned into the wind like the tulips in the garden. There was loss at the heart of each blossom. In my version of the story, Scheherazade, bored with sex, with waiting hour after hour for her little death, asked if the king had heard about the child born to a woman named War. In my version of the story, Scheherazade said, a man named Beauty abducted the child. Beauty left the child to die alone in a land where they could not speak or find their way home. In my version of the story, Scheherazade pushing his hair from his face informed the king that War brought fire down on every hill and valley, canyon and cliff, searching for the child. In my version of the story, Scheherazade, when the king doubted that someone would destroy everything in their path for another, asked if he wasn't also doing that because of love. In my version of the story, Scheherazade extinguished the candles. The smoke looked like moths in the moonlight. The king asked what love is. This, she answered. He asked what happened next. She said, and then? Just like that, that moment when he went limp inside me the torment of his body and his mind coming to a stop as if a scorpion seeing a mouse in the desert, the tail like a whip drawn back, the poisonous barb coming down, but not before the prey opened its mouth to take the sting, to tear through the predator, sending a cry hundreds of feet into the night, the air suddenly alive, all that I felt and denied was over, just like that. Once more at the temple, sweeping the courtyard, the leaves like shrapnel or ships crossing a darkening sea, a memory my mother recounts and recants, insisting that when she was taken to shore by soldiers who did what she won't say they did, to her she was spared because she had promised her life to serve. I got down on my knees in front of the Buddha, my broom cast aside like the sword belonging to the brigand who wore a necklace of 999 human fingers and I wiped the earth from her feet with my own hands.
unlike some animals, some spiders and birds for whom darkness is a way to hide, to disappear until they want to be found, to lure a lover or a kill, which under a certain light can be the same depending on the desire. There are those who do not want to be found. For them, for the fang tooth, the Pacific black dragon moving through the darkness of the deep sea, absorbing the light into their bodies. Darkness is not the opposite of light. Darkness is light. I used to believe that I wanted to be found. I rented a room in a basement where, with the door ajar on all fours, a man pretending to be my king could do what he wanted. Darkness, light, I'm not sure what I believe anymore. My mother's name is Gian. My father's name is me. Gian comes from the Vietnamese word for war. Me comes from the Vietnamese word for beauty. I'm a child of war. I'm a child of beauty. Beauty took me from war. Beauty left me. War found me. I left where I come from. I found other wars and other beauties. I took me from them. I took me from me until I learned to take me with me. Gien comes also from the Vietnamese word for victory. A mystery is a story. A story is a mirror. A mirror is a poem. A poem is a pattern. A pattern is repetition. Repetition is emphasis. The emphasis is the reason for repetition. Repetition is also a break in a pattern. Breaking a pattern is the reason for a poem. A poem is a mirror I use to look not at, but into myself, my story, mystery. I too will be victorious like my mother, like Scheherazade, I'll survive in the end. I'll survive the end. Even when I was helpless, I was not hopeless. Always I'm told there's more to know, to feel, to do. Today, before dawn, I'm listening to the water as I wash and dry and stack each spoon atop the other, amused by the exactitude of their design. How such things exist in this world where unbelievable things occur and recur without design or exactitude is no longer, at least to me, a matter of how, but of belief. Years ago, I learned of the painters who painted over their paintings. Historians, they call it pentimento. I call it being alive. Listen, you will understand me. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to ask our next reader to unmute. Tanika Kelly is our next reader. And I can't wait since I just moved to Asheville and you are reading in Asheville tomorrow. So I'm going to get a double dose this week. So I'm excited to actually get to meet you in person tomorrow. I'm going to take you back to 2021. And in this interview, just to clarify, they are interviewing and talking about the renunciations and so this is the question that was asked. How did you practice self-care and how did you keep yourself safe while delving into such sensitive material? And this really, really stayed with me. And so this is what you said. Once I knew I was going to be writing poems about my memories and childhood, sexual abuse, 
I made sure that I had a therapist. I worked closely with my therapist to talk about the things I remembered and questions I had and underlying emotional concerns that were bringing these memories up. That helped me write the poems. The other thing I did is when it got stressful and I felt scared while writing, I just stopped or I reminded myself I was safe and not in any danger. All I was doing was writing a poem and I could stop at any time. I've had experiences where I felt like I was trapped in something like writing a poem, but reminding myself that the stakes are quite low and remembering I don't have to keep writing. Those moments gave me the opportunity to think about why I'm writing the poem and why it feels important to write about the topic or memory. Asking those questions gets me into a different place other than simply recounting the memory. That feels like a safer place to hold to the inquiry, to think about what's different about me now and what I understand about myself. That creates space to do some good work through the speaker of the poems. Thank you for being here tonight. The screen is yours. Thank you, Dustin. Uh, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I'm very excited to be reading with Paul and Carl. Uh, I feel very, very fortunate. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to read just a couple of poems from the Renunciations. Thank you for the reminder, Paul. <laughs> from your press. <laughs> uh, and then I'm going to read mostly some newer work uh, from a manuscript and process, uh, in part because the poems and the renunciations feels uh, sad. They, a lot of them feel sad to me. Uh, and I uh, am not super interested in feeling sad tonight. So <laughs> uh, I'm going to uh, try to move uh, into a slightly different direction, but I thought I might read a couple of poems from uh, the Renunciations. So the first one I will read um, is titled In the Chapel of St. Mary's. I can't tell you what happened there, why I entered the sanctuary, a non-believer, only that I have been thinking about worship, the altar of the body, and supplication for some time. My thoughts turn, as they often do in the season of absence, to my wife and how tired a god can get when called and too often for little reason but loneliness. Of course, I don't mean God here, but rather the woman I love who alters the orbit of my life, pulls me with the density of light toward her, the draw thinner when she is farther away as she is now. I try to find comfort in the inevitability of science when what I lack is faith. The sanctuary, the stained glass, four girls saturating it with soft chatter, small pots of stargazer lilies, a lace ribbon for each pew. This place is full of faith in the unknown, and I don't know how to believe in what I cannot see. Tonight, I will drive through the foothills and into the valley. I will try to make a little practice to trust you are with me, even though you are somewhere else. Uh, and I'm actually just, I'm going to read the last poem in the book. So that, that, that was the first one. This is the, the last one from the renunciations that I'll read. Uh, and this is titled, uh, the moon rose over the bay. I had a lot of feelings. The home I've been making inside myself started with a raising, a brush clearing, the thorn and nettle, the blackberry bush falling under the bush hog. Then I rested. A cycle fallow said winter, said the ground is too cold to break pony, said I almost set fire to it all, lit a match, watched a ghost in the wind. Came the thaw, came the melting snowpack, the flooded river, new groundwater, the well risen. I stood in the mud field and called it a pasture, stood with a needle in my mouth and called it a song. Everything rushed past my small ears, were in the leaves, were in the wing and the wood. About time to get a hammer, I thought. About time to get a nail and saw. Okay. Uh, all right. Yeah, so just new work. Uh, just some just some new work. Uh, and I'm just grateful to y'all for your for your lovely attention. Can't wait wait to read the chat. <laughs> all right, so this is titled uh, Brood. My chest is earth, 
I meant to write, my chest is warm, but earth will do to exhume a heart, breathe. I meant to write, beat. Did you know I was alive the whole time? I was alive in the ground, but torpor, but torpor. Slowed beat, my chest filled like a jar with dirt. I mean, dearth. For slow months at rest in the hole I'd made in myself, a frozen ground, a ground in thaw. I mean, spring is coming. I mean, I push the wet dirt with my mandible. I mean, jaw, jaw, y'all. I know I am not a nymph in exuma exhumation, but would you please explain this half-remembered light? Uh, I think it was like 2011, the cicadas came out of the ground in Nashville. Um, maybe Christina remembers this. Uh, it was, it was harrowing. Uh, but the, the image of like that, uh, those creatures just coming up like zombies or something else uh, just has really stayed with me. So this is self-portrait as a body, a C. I am a body schooling, a ball of fish flashing and many in these early days of feeling, of love, when I learned hours ago of fish songs that swell like bird song in the morning, how they foghorn or buzz for food or mates or space, I thought, now aren't I a humming thing? Yes, you say, a body of oceans and marvelous. And the sea anemone in me growing on the wreckage of an old ship, can they grow that way, I wonder, on an ending? Still, this bright and tentacled anthozoan polyp which reaches and filters whatever it needs from this strong current, and the current too that carries the sea cucumbers, the rough mammals, the life, both vertebrate and invertebrate, even the batfish, the black jewfish, and the terrapontid. It all swells and breaks in me like a chorus at dusk. Oh, I remember the thing that I wanted to say. The new poems are also just like, almost all of them are uh, love poems uh, to or about. They're about me, um, <laughs> but they are uh, about uh, the relationship with uh, my sweetie who is sitting right next to me. You can't see her, but she's right here. There's her hand. Um, and she and I are both reading together uh, tomorrow, which is which is thrilling. Melissa Thibos off camera. Um, I don't know why I felt compelled to say that before this poem, but maybe that will, it will become obvious. Uh, so this is confronted with the argument of your body soaring, well-measured, I consider yielding, I consider presenting my own body, also soaring, also well-measured, not encounter, but an echo in mirror, beloved, I consider a future in the same space, the rough geometry, as you say, of my body in the periphery of your gaze, the body as formula, as proof, as theorem, some small resolution to a family of questions of distance. First, the animal I am, the approximation of God and machine that aches and aches when we are apart, then the practice of managing my limbs, tumbling in space, breathing, breathing, my skin that burns until it is covered or itches and must be born because it cannot be exchanged, then your body in narrow resolution and high definition, the moment we return to one another, the only boundary, skin, revelation, and ecosystem, what I found there in the loam, the damp, of course, I'm talking here about fucking, shattered as I've been on the crest of wanting to be inside you. I'm talking, of course, metaphysically, how every part of you feels against my tongue, how you close around my hand. Another way of saying that when I am inside you, I am no longer tumbling, but an animal, base and humming, free from the conceit of reason. Uh, <laughs> I like how poems are like little time machines and sometimes the times that we get to go back to are not sad. Um, so uh, this next poem is uh, called Grain. Uh, yeah, it's called Grain. I've gotten sloppy in my Scandinavian style recliner, sloppy with the curtains open and the lights off, nighttime being the right time to wander, the house quiet, my hinterlands terrain slick. I've been at it for hours, wading the marsh, the delta, sounding the aquifer, restless and roving, and now the smell of lemons, the smell of metal, the buoyancy of salt, 
I've been at it for days, this frilling, this frittering, this pruning, this carrying of water from one mouth to another, the glint of gold come the oiled wood, this body polished, a stone, a line, a carapace glistening, and the mulch for decades, for a century. I come like ants falling from a tree in early autumn, often and inexorable, one indistinguishable from another, industrious and complete, carrying sugar, carrying grain to the colony for winter. Oh, great. Uh... All right. All right. This poem uh, is titled Breach. It's not about me and Phoebos, uh, but it is about whales, kind of. Uh, I, I like the sound of it, so I'm going to share this one. So Breach. The mandible, and behind it, 99 steps. The mandible, boiled and arced high enough to hold the cemetery, the close stacked houses, and the abbey across the water. The original bones balanced atop the mast, the original bones replaced by a fin whale's jaw, the fin whale's jaw replaced by a bowhead's jaw. I stood under the bower of bone and felt myself trying to get outside myself, sacks first and inside out. I felt myself, my assorted sacks and straps arranged in and around my cathedral of bones. I dropped my jaw into the earth. I called this a smile. Under the bone arch at the cliff's edge, I was inside out for the woman behind the camera. She had baleen arms. She was a strainer. I was caught in her plates and her fine hairs. I thought better to be inside the whale of a woman than the bones of a whale. Better the fun house of the mind. How many of me laid end to end and down again? Seven and a quarter, keystone to pavestone. Better the fun house than the sublime. Balloon animals in the skull. Devil's punch bowl on the moors. 17 years ago and my sacks still dip. I had no business under those jaw bones. No business with the woman. No business on film, though I wouldn't call it pleasure. Even now, even now I wouldn't hold my own gaze. I love you. I miss you. Please get out of my house. Maybe I'll have this experience. Maybe you have a sweetie <laughs> and you need alone time. Uh, and we really like this title. Uh, I, and I like reading it. So I'm gonna read it one more time. Uh, I love you. I miss you. Please get out of my house. Nothing today hasn't happened before. I woke alone, bundled the old dog into his early winter coat, watered him, fed him, left him to his cage for the day closing just now. My eye drifts to the buff belly of a hawk wheeling as they do in a late fall light that melts against the turning oak and smelts its leaves bronze. Before you left, I bent to my task, fixed in my mind the slopes and planes of your face, fitted in some essential geography, your belly stretch and collapse against my own, your scent familiar as a thousand evenings. Another time I might have dismissed as hunger, this cataloging, this fitting, this fixing, but today I crest the hill secure in the company of my longing. What binds us stretches, a tautness I've missed as a sapling supple misses the wind. So two more, uh, and again, thank you for your wonderful attention. This is titled, What is the Measure for M? I catalog what I cannot capture. The sun, its ragged stumble into rock face, the precise elevation, elevation of this plateau or the next, the sea, of course, against which everything is measured. My tools are insufficient, inexact. For instance, there is no way to measure the peak against the distance from the tip of one ring finger to the other, no matter my arm's position, outstretched, limp, akimbo. For instance, there is no way to weigh the earth pushed out of earth against the gravity of my body, its bones, its sacks, its meat and animating light. I submit. I do not constitute the mountain. This in spite of the palette of old quilts and newly fallen maple leaves I've made at its immeasurable base. I submit. I do not constitute the field, although I have harrowed its length, its width with my narrow feet and slow step. 
Never mind, I hear what scurries or scatters, what burrows or bounds. Never mind, I raise my hand to hover the bent grass, the echinacea's bald crown, all of which withers or writhes, all of which is new or nearly the same before my foot's next fall. I submit, as with the mountain, the field. As with the field, you. Ineluctable as a season, sun ragging the rock face. Your arm nearly as long as mine, your palm wider, your mouth the beginning, your eyes, of course, that against which everything else is measured. You harrow and the summit writhes. Your broad foot falls and the field akimbo gives up its gravity, lets loose its bodies, its bones, thrums and animating light. Okay, and the last poem uh, is brand new. Uh, our, is brand new. So, uh, but I thought I would uh, be brave uh, in this very warm, very generous space. So thank y'all again. Uh, and let's see how this goes. So this is titled The Crone at Her Sink. Of course, the sink is never empty or rather empties briefly, then is full again. The one plate, the one mug, the many spoons, a knife, which I sharpen, which dulls. Outside the window, night clatters, comes, the water drained, metal too, me too, sunk in the bed's shallow mouth, the pit I've worn into the ticking, the night like a sink, full, trill of air, rushing the spiracle, swelling the throat pouch, a silent wing, then scream, wet paw in the litter, in the brush, like the night I sink, small hollow in the throat, full of water, turgid, full of metal too. I feel with my paw the small holes of my body, the small ponds, the bank beside, feel with my wing a shallowing cup, the spoon's horizon. I swallow, knife of the mind, which I sharpen, which I dull, a sword. To myself I say, choose, do I empty, am I full? Thank you. Thank you, sweetie. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I'm going to drop in the chat really quickly, just the housekeeping stuff. So reading schedule, Facebook links, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. We have a link tree, save that link. If you enjoy the Wild and Precious Life series, please just share a link about it, tweet about us. That's all I want. Don't want your money. Just want some free publicity on your social media accounts because it's the best way to get people to tune in. We have a reading coming up on September 20th and on the 18th of October. I have that information in the chat. But also you can find that if you go to that link tree because it'll take you to our schedule page on the Wild and Precious Life series website. So I am going to ask our final fabulous reader to unmute Carl Phillips and so Carl for your introduction I have two interviews that I'm going to reference I'm not taking you that far back for the first one I'm only taking you back to the summer of this year you were asked you have called poetry pattern language what does that mean and this is what you had to say a poem is made of patterns and the meaningful interruption of those patterns. There's sound, there's diction. A certain word might keep reoccurring. A certain image could come through throughout the poem at different moments. And the artistry of writing a poem is getting those patterns to work in such a way that you condition the reader's expectations and you meaningfully disrupt those expectations at different points. There's actual motion. And that's a poem that lifts off the page. So now I'm going to take you back to 2020. And the interviewer had this to say and asked these questions. Given your personal background, sexuality and ethnicity in particular, I imagine there being trials and obstacles that you have encountered. Do you have any advice for writers facing similar struggles? Would you agree that your poetry has opened doors for the writers hoping to make an impact as you have? And I liked what you had to say. My advice is always to write the poems you absolutely have to write without regard for how others will receive them. That's the only way to write honestly, I believe. And then it's important not to have expectations about audience. I really have only written to myself 
which means in the beginning that to write was a way of understanding myself and the things I was grappling with. I didn't even think I'd be sending poems to magazines or having, having them in books. And not every reader has been a fan of my poems by any means, but I'm gratified to realize that there are readers out there and especially gratified to know that my poems have opened doors for other writers, but more importantly, for other people who aren't writers at all. I've been told that my poems have helped people feel seen and less alone, and that's given them the courage to move forward. I feel incredibly lucky to think that's true. And we're incredibly lucky to have you tonight. The screen is yours. Thank you, Dustin. <clears throat> Can you hear me? I guess that's yes, okay. Um, I'm always worried about Wi-Fi for some reason. I, I live in a cowboy town, so everything's shaky. And thanks for that introduction. I, I have to say, I just finished teaching my prosody class this afternoon, and I the last thing I feel is smart about poetry, to be honest. But, you know, we'll try. Just read some poems. Um, and thank you, uh, Paul and Danica, for those stunning readings, both of you. And um, I'm very honored to be reading with you. So thank you. Um, OK, I'm going to read mostly from my book, Then the War. I guess we're supposed to hold it, right? And um, But I'm going to also read some new poems from a book that's coming out next year. So um, like three poems from a book coming out next year. But I don't have the book to show you, so don't even have a cover. Um, so I'll just start. I'm just going to set my little timer. Because uh, if I see the clock moving, It keeps me scared. Okay, this is called Like So. From attention to adoration is a smallish distance. And yet no arrow, no boat with sail can cross it like the mind's insistence. We'd reached the marshes by then that all the dead must come to. I could see my face tilted there like a solar eclipse viewed indirectly which is the proper way in a basin of water. You must hold it steady, keep the basin safe from the wind's reach, its competing powers of revelation and distortion. Quick. Vikings. The Vikings thought the wind was a god, that the eyes were holes, a window meant a wind eye for the god to see with, and at the same time through. I used to hate etymology. What's the point, I'd whisper. I was quieter back then, less patient, though more easily pleased. I am pleased to have been of use, I used to say to myself, after sex with strangers. Leaning hard against the upstairs window, I'd watch them make their half-proud, half, -proud, half ashamed looking way wherever. And if it was autumn, whether in fact or only metaphorically, I'd watch the yard fill with leaves, then with what I at first thought was urgency, though it usually turned out just to be ambition. I'd leave the window open, as I do now, if closed. Which of the many I've tried remains the best way I know still to catch a wind god breathing. All right, rolling along here. Uh, I'm gonna read a poem called Storm. From the waist down at least, nothing unfamiliar. Cypress trees, the catalpa, its seed pods hanging like shadow icicles, and the light around them, and the bodies that enter the light and leave it, your own among them. But as when the body seems most to want, impossibly, to step free of itself, oblivion of wish, of wishing. About sanctuary, how over time it makes the birds come closer, how that's different from trust, isn't it? What the fuck do you think you're looking at? 
he says softly. What a thing to say. The mind protecting itself by shutting down an intimacy that most likely won't be returned. Why expect it? As if that were the mind's chief purpose, to resist a fall, though falling's what the body does best, is quick to rise for it, moving toward you with all the ceremony of many wings at once outspread, a holiday descending. The dark adjusts itself, settles its wings inside you. The shadows that strut the dark open and fold like hope, a paper fan, violence in its pitch and fall like waves. Above them, the usual sea birds, their presumable indifference to chance, its blonde convergences. As when telling cruelty apart from chivalry can come to seem irrelevant, or not anymore the main point. He touches himself here and here, directive, turns his face away. It can look like ransom. Now it looks like privilege, now recklessness, now triumph, gravel and blood, humiliation, lovely, now strict refrain, he taketh my hand in his. Just a little poem about picnic. That's how it started out, Amy. Uh, okay, here's something shorter. It's called, And If I Fall. There's this cathedral in my head I keep making from cricket song and dying but rogue in spirit still bamboo. Not making. I keep imagining it as if that were the same thing as making. And as if making might bring it back somehow, the real cathedral. In anger, as in desire, it was everything, that cathedral. As if my body itself cathedral. I conduct my body with a cathedral steadiness. I try to. I cathedral. In desire. In anger. Light enters a cathedral the way persuasion fills a body. Light enters a cathedral the way persuasion fills a body. I live next door to a cathedral, literally. So it kind of gets in the poems. I had to make myself stop using the word. Uh, all right. Uh, the title of this poem is If It Must Be Winter. And I got the title from a line from Linda Gregg. Uh, she has a poem whose last line is, um, if it must be winter, let it be absolutely winter. So just giving some credit where credit's due. If it must be winter. Not crowns, not conquests defined in terms of how many fear you or fear to say otherwise. Not by these will you know your own royalty, but in smaller ways, how to the least gesture there's more power than seems reasonable, though it will feel deserved. So I was told, and they have not proved wrong. I've but to open my hand, bees come to it, the slick fur of bees assembling as toward an honor in no way expected, though each time the honor remains mine as if almost it should, as if certain privileges had to do with destiny. Do I believe that? Do I? My hand a sea, across which the wings of the bees flash like signal flags, whose patterns, instead of translating, I make up my own translations for. I shall do as I please. As a lovely argument, can make a difficult truth more clear, if not more sweet. Though is there not a sweetness to clarity that can almost make the truth seem worth it? To say I'm not quite sure makes me no less king here. Sometimes I open my hand and there's no sea at all, just a windy plain. What appear to be dust storms crossing it turn out on reaching me to be the disappointments, all of them, that I never intended each one on horseback, my cavalry, each face raised toward mine, as if awaiting command, 
hungering for it, forgetful or stupid. I can see no difference. Look away from me. I haven't said you can look at me. I don't mean that to you. I just, that's the half the poem in. You can keep looking. Um, <clears throat> though it's unnerving, I have to say. Uh, this poem is called Fist and Palm. And uh, that's what it's called. You kind of have to imagine riding a horse, except the horse you're riding is you. One part of you is the horse, and one part of you is the rider. Vista and Palm. There are plenty who'd hardly recognize me now. I used to be that cruel, by which I mean I was frightened mostly, and now I'm mostly not. Joy, if only flickeringly, each day astounds me. The man I used to be dismounts, relents for a bit, before digging his boots, streaked with longing, my own longing, what I can't help, hard into my sides again, into the man I've become. His way of reminding me we've only stopped for rest, a short rest, some water. We've years to go still. He has his job, I have mine. Speechlessness is not an option, he whispers into my ear. He spits on the words themselves after, as if to make them stay, or just to make sure I'm listening. But I'm always listening, as I always obey. Isn't this obedience, these songs I've built from things too difficult to speak of? I don't know. Is that obedience? I don't know. What can you say? Uh, this set list has changed a lot of times, so I keep staring at it and thinking that's not, don't read that, don't read that. Um, okay, I'm going to read a poem called uh, uh, Fixed Shadow Moving Water. That's what it's called. One friend tells me everything's political. Another says nothing is. We just make it political. By we, he means human beings, I assume. What's political to a fox curled in, a, curled in sleep or pond or sycamore in winter with no leaves left to stop the snow falling through it? I have loved you for less time than I have loved some others, but none more deeply than you no one more absolutely, which, as if inevitably, amounts to a hierarchy of sorts, doesn't it? Value, then the power that comes with it, soon enough the distribution of power, who gets to do the distributing. But if we can make of tenderness a countervailing force, the two of us, if we can make from tenderness, a revolution. What's the end? Because if, who knows? Um, all right. So really, this this is um, this is the last poem. So I think we're going to be a little under fifteen minutes. But you know, it's nothing, no crime to read a little shorter. Um, it's called Defiance, and. Uh, I always feel like I should make up something to say so I can have poetry chat, but I don't have anything to say. That's why I write poems. Um, then they just kind of say whatever. Okay, so it's called Defiance. Thanks for hanging out, staying on. Defiance. Some say the point of war is to make the need for tenderness more clear. Some say that's an effect of war, the way beauty can be. Homer's Iliad, for example. Or, many centuries later, how the horse's head, to protect it in combat, would be fitted with a chaffron, 
a strip of steel, sometimes mixed with copper, all of it hammer-worked, parts detailed in gold. I love you as I've always loved you, one man says, meaning it to another. That doesn't make love true. This only needs to be troubling if we want it to be. Our minds are as the days are, dark or bright, says Homer, the words like coral bells in a pot made to look like the head of an ancient god, a sea god, moss for seaweed across the old god's face. To believe in ritual in the name of hope, there lies disaster. and turned to him and took his hand, the scarred one. I could feel the scars, little crowns, mass coronation. For by then, all the lilies on the pond had opened. Thanks very much. I'm gonna mute myself now. Thank you so much for that reading, Carl. I'm going to put the information about the Wild Precious Life in the chat. Um, if you're watching this, once it's on YouTube, that's also just going to be under the video you're watching so you can find it. I put everyone links to everyone's books in here. So as I always like to say, if you don't have the money to buy a book today, please save these links and purchase one of the books when you do. The best way to support writers is to purchase the books that they write. Thank you for being here. And again, if you enjoyed yourself tonight, all I ask is could you send out a tweet or I think it's a post now, whatever the fuck it's called these days. If you could do the X, the Twitter, the thread, the blue sky, the gray sky, all the social medias, all of them say something about the Wild and Precious Life series, it would be very, very much appreciated. And this is one of the months where we actually have two readings. So if you want to come back next week, there's a reading and then we'll kick it back off in October. So thank you so much for being here tonight. And you have a fabulous, fabulous evening.